Welcome to today's Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association webinar, Sense and Sustainability, ESG and the LGPS. My name is Rachel Pine, and I look after content for the PLSA's conferences and training offerings. Thank you for joining today. As you may know, the middle of May is when the PLSA holds its annual local authority conference in Gloucestershire. While this year's conference was canceled, we're using this week to present some of the content we would have covered there. Earlier this week, we looked at how the LGPS is being impacted by the pandemic and how the regulator is responding to that impact. We also looked at how tier three employers are coping and what administering authorities may want to understand about this set of employers. Today's webinar, we'll look at a variety of topics within the broader headline of responsible investment. The speakers will discuss types of responsible investment, the regulatory picture that is emerging around it, explain stewardship and voting, and how responsible investing works vis-a-vis -vis LA funds and the investment pools. Joining us today are Faith Ward, Chief Responsible Investment Officer at Brunel Pensions Partnership, the 30 billion pound investment pool, which invests on behalf of 10 funds. Faith sits on many committees covering responsible investing, both nationally and internationally, and is a recognized expert on this topic. Speaking alongside Faith is my colleague, Caroline Escott, who is the PLSA's lead on investment and stewardship. Caroline heads up our diversity and inclusion initiative and has also authored our newly revised stewardship and voting guidelines. Faith and Caroline both sit at the forefront of responsible investment understanding and they have a lot to share with us today. But before we start, we have a couple of polling questions for you. The questions will pop up on your screen. So for the first question, the government is asking all UK pensions to align with the TCFD recommendations. How familiar are you with this information? Okay, so it looks like we've got almost, it's broken down almost evenly into quarters. So very good for our panelists to know, although 20, you know, nearly a third. So a work is in progress, wrapping our heads around it. So really we've got people listening today who are with all stages of familiarity. So I'm gonna stop this poll and send the next one. So the second poll, we're asking you, have you heard from stakeholders, such as council taxpayers, asking about your funds plans regarding climate or fossil fuels? So I'm gonna share those results. So it looks like, so more than half have had this proposed as an agenda item. Um, some have had no real interest, couple of letters, and some have had meetings disrupted. So, but nice to see more than half um, have this as an agenda item. So I'm going to stop the results now, and I'm going to use this opportunity to welcome our panelists. So thank you, Faith and Caroline. Faith, if you'd like to start, I'm going to turn the conversation over to you. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and, and I am and I'm missing everybody. It's uh, you know one of those really enjoyed um, getting down there. It is sunny here in in Wiltshire, which obviously for me wouldn't have been such a long way to travel to. Um, to, to, to the venue on this particular occasion. Um, really um, actively ask you, as you would have done um, had we all been in a room together to get those question and, question and answers in, because I mean, these sessions are so much more interesting if we answer the questions you want to ask rather than the ones that we, we think you might be interested in. So please do actively use um, that Q&A button. Um, so probably to kick off um, on, on the TCFD um, side of it, so the first four, four letter acronym there. So we're talking about the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And what um, uh, Rachel was alluding to was the uh, government strategy that was published last year where the government set out its ambition uh, that asset owners and asset managers um, were, would be reporting to those um, requirements by 2022. Um, I do encourage you to look at it. It is one of the resources that we've actually linked to this um, because it is actually quite a useful framework. It kind of sets out kind of in four blocks um, how to approach kind of managing of, of climate risk from an investment relevant uh, perspective, how it sort of materially impacts from those investment returns. So it starts off with like the governance in terms of the meetings, the training you've had, how that flows through to your investment strategy, how you manage those risks, what are the metrics you might use along that process to then not only manage the risk, but also then to demonstrate to, to beneficiaries that you've uh, managing it and how that um, might equate. I think one of the most tricky parts of the, the task force uh, requirements is around scenarios. Uh, and it'd be fair to say, uh, I, I don't know many funds, even globally, who've completely nailed that one. It's very much something that is sort of work in progress. Um, but uh, there's a lot in there that we're sort of 
uh, working on. Um, Caroline and myself have been uh, supporting the Department of Work and Pensions and the um, Pensions Regulator Group on providing some guidelines, not to the LGPS, but to the, um, to the, to the, to the wider pensions industry on, on supporting them in fulfilling these requirements or expectations that we see around reporting on climate risk. Um, and I think those will also be, be, be useful um, to, to the LGPS in due course. And we have been sort of linking in with Bob and he's online uh, and the team um, to see how these could um, be useful in, in developing um, some, some supporting uh, information there more, more broadly. Those are currently out for consultation. Um, I know that, as I say, they're not directly asking or asks on the LGPS as such, but I think it would be really constructive to hear the voices uh, from the LGPS on those, or on what issues or what are those uh, in information that's identified in there that you feel strongly is the right way to go, what you think perhaps where, where perhaps improvements could be made. So I think uh, responding to that consultation is something I would um, actively um, encourage you to do. So that sort of kicks us off a little bit with the TCFD. I, I certainly say recommend it's quite a, I find it quite a useful framework as I say a little bit of a checklist on how to kind of like an action plan uh, we get asked a lot to deal with uh, climate change and it sets out some sort of quite straightforward steps if you like on a journey to managing climate risk so but I'm happy to ask more specific answer more specific questions that uh, our audience might have on that one but perhaps Caroline if you want to um, jump in I know that the, this is an area that PLSA has done a huge amount of work on over the years and and as I say, we've been working together to support in this working group. Yeah, thank you, Faith. Um, yeah, so maybe just a few comments from, from mine or, or the PLSA's perspective. So investing in climate change is one of the big themes for the organising organization this year it has remained that way even in the wake of a little bit of a reprioritization of resources and priorities in the wake of COVID-19 as well um, but it's remained a priority not only because there's a whole load of regulation coming down the track but because we really believe that it's a systemic issue um, I support Faith's call to everyone to respond to the consultation. I agree that it does have broader relevance. And I think that's actually one of the really interesting things about the regulatory and policy framework at the moment. So we saw the, the LGPS as, as leaders um, in responsible investment. You know, you've really been, many of you, doing lots of really interesting good things for a long time ahead of the private sector schemes. And there are a number of reasons for that which I won't go into because they're very well known to everyone. In recent years, we have seen new investment regulations for private sector schemes or changes in investment regulations for private sector schemes really start trying to bring private sector schemes sort of up to that level um, and with these new requirements. And I think one of the things that we at the PLSA are really keen to emphasize is that a lot of the stuff that's happening in the private sector scheme hit sphere is coming down the track now in terms of statutory guidance, in terms of pulling out climate risk from the pool of ESG risks and opportunities, that's coming down the track for the LGPS funds as well. So PCRIG, this, this asset owner guidance for TCFD, will have broader relevance. There are other bits of work that the PLSA is doing. We, um, you might have seen that we recently launched a working group to support schemes and thinking about how they communicate what they're doing on ESG more generally. Now the hook for that has been the 2018 and 2019 changes to the investment regulations again for private sector schemes but we've actually got some LGPS funds on board feeding in because we are aware that what we say in terms of ESG communications will have relevance for LGPS funds more generally. We know that the funds are often at the sharp end of sort of some of the campaigns. We know that a lot of you have been doing really good work in terms of telling the ESG responsible investment story to various stakeholders and we're keen to make sure that, that input continues. Super great and I think there are already some um, excellent examples of uh, carbon disclosure within the LGPS that the, the, the private sector funds can you know can leverage and look at and um, certainly Brunel and I know LGPS Central have, have produced them I think of the underlying funds the Environment Agency Pension Fund obviously I'm quite familiar with them has also done a uh, task force for climate related financial disclosures so there are already examples out there from the LGPS community that the private sector can can, can leverage so I do think there is that um, opportunity to, con to continue to share best practice between the public and private schemes as we as we go forward and about one of the things that is becoming more relevant in terms of esg and stewardship practice seems to be this idea of collaborative engagement so 
pooling your voice with those of other asset owners or asset managers who have similar perspectives. And of course, the LGPS funds and the pools have been doing a whole load of really interesting work around, you know, Faith, I know you're involved in the Transition Pathway Initiative, there's Climate Action 100 as well. So as the new stewardship code tries to encourage signatories to think about collaborative engagements, think about the outcome of collaborative engagements and how you might escalate the process, um, we will hopefully see LGPS funds really helping lead the whole pension scheme sector, um, by example, when it comes to working in partnership with other investors to really influence positive corporate behaviour. No, absolutely. And um, I think you've only got to look at the work of the uh, of, of LAPS uh, and the work that it's done and, and focus on that and around disclosure. I think the LGPS funds are also very well placed because there is... Um, we have a natural kind of transparency agenda. You know, we, we are subject mm. to freedom of information. I know that that causes some angst at times. Believe me, I'm, I've been at the receiving end of having to respond to many of those. Um, but the, the we, we do operate in a very open and transparent way. We've been leaders in cost transparency, uh, amongst other sort of ESG themes there. And, and so there's there's many areas where I think, as you say, that... that um, that drive for disclosure across the entire investment train. A lot of that has been driven by, by the LGPS. Um, so the Transition Pathway Initiative, which I co-chair um, and I'm very passionate about, it was, it was an initiative very much designed to support um, funds um, and, and investors or globally all over. All over. But the, the, the idea of that tool is very much, as you indicate, Caroline, is to make it easier to demonstrate the um, actions that you've taken and the outcomes and, and the changes in either disclosure or the carbon performance of some of our most carbon intense companies. It's a, obviously it's a free online tool that's um, open open access. It was, it was um, developed by, by the Church of England and the Environment Agency back in 2017 and now has I think about 18 trillion pounds worth of uh, public um, support globally, including, uh, so we've got some new members of our steering committee from New Zealand and Australia. So very much is, is, is supporting investors um, across the globe. And, and we use it within um, Brunel specifically to very much reset our targets and our recent uh, climate policy around TPI in terms of what uh, where we see our material holdings in terms of their disclosure levels. And then also using it to support um, in some of these scenarios and looking at kind of where some of our significant holdings are placed in terms of where pathways as it were to, to meeting those sort of Paris um, Paris agreements and those Paris so there's lots of really useful stuff that funds can use there and I say uh, supported financially by those asset owners but as, a, as a, a free public good to try and enable all investors to, to get a grip of the, these issues and the TPI itself um, actually is the governance um, strictly provides us um, over overlay if you like for climate action 100 plus it, it also helps to track and is used extensively to report the progress of that wider initiative um, which obviously has uh, leading gauges and I think you can just see some of the evidence of the outcomes of that we've seen some really massive shifts in, in the oil and gas sector. The work that um, Rubico and the church have done directly as lead engagers in Shell has been uh, recently publicized very highly. Um, some absolutely massive uh, steps forward there in, in terms of that have been driven by working, as you say, in a collaboration. For those not less familiar with Climate Action 100 Plus, I think the number now is about 30, still about 33 trillion. It may be, may be bigger now. I don't know whether they've counted BlackRock in there yet in terms of that, that those numbers, because that was certainly one of the uh, and, and you know a good uh, addition to to that collaborative uh, forum to have the largest asset manager in the world participating for those objectives but it, it is the largest collaboration of investors uh, that's ever grouped as you were to on a common basis to try and progress um, that agenda of trying to get to a, a, low, a low carbon transition and to meet the objectives of Paris so um, the, there is so much now for investors to kind of get behind and support and, and a lot of um, our, our funds you know it's not just to do with I know we talk off, quite often about pools but a lot of the funds are di directly involved in that too so, so it's very much a collaborative partnership approach. Very good well thank you for that. Um, I was going to mention you touched on the Transway Pathway Initiative but you also mentioned that there'd be some other free resources that people could use we have all the links but can you talk a little bit about some of those? 
No, absolutely. So people will be familiar probably because they thought, oh, face banging on about the fact that they've uh, published their climate policy, but it was a substantial piece of work that Brunel issued in, in January this year, but that came about with working with our underlying clients for, for like the six, nine months before that. Um, and obviously every uh, individual fund or, or the clients had different investment strategies and had, had different starting points. So we did quite a lot of workshops and one of the tools I found particularly useful, not only with my own board internally um, and, and with, uh, with the, with the clients as well was the um, PRI, the Principles of Responsible Investment, have been doing work on what they call the IPR, to say we love our three-letter acronyms in this industry, the Inevitable Policy Response. And that piece of research is freely available, very rich, and actually has a lot of information in it. But the first starting point is actually a, um, a YouTube clip of Nathan Fabian. He's the Chief Investment Officer of the PRI, and he very succinctly uh, describes about how these the climate impacts will have an impact on you on your pension fund and what you can do to start the process going to manage those impacts in 18 minutes and um, I just it's a really good uh, 18 minutes uh, watch and I think it's quite a useful tool to, to, to use with your beneficiaries with your uh, your pension committee anybody who you want to kind of convey kind of the issues that you're you're trying to get to grips with um, so that's one of the tools now behind that then on the PRI website is um, a whole even really much more dense information um, about kind of some of the changes or what the forecasts the work that the the PRI has done with an organization called Vivid Economics and some of the forecasts that the PRI PRI are saying um, so in terms of internal combustion engine declining coal consumption um, changes in some of the dietary things that will have their knock-on sectoral impacts that will have impacts on our on our, our financial investments. So much much deeper and richer information underpinning that. Say all freely available. So we would highly recommend that as um, uh, a go-to resource um, to again freely available to to, to help get uh, get funds uh, further down the line. Many, I mean, as I say, the RGPS has been many, many funds have been doing this for quite some time, but um, it just kind of help you particularly with that scenario, which I said in earlier was one of the trickiest um, areas to, to get to grips with. And, and, and uh, I've been working in this area for a long time and I'm just, you know, still trying to digest all that information and that forecast information. Uh, one of the other ones we could link, uh, I don't think we've mentioned it uh, so far, is actually some of the work the Bank of England have done um, around their forecasts. And they've, um, they've done some scenarios um, as to what the, how they see the future panning out. We've done three different scenarios and what the sectoral impacts of that will be on different um, areas of our market. And then you can use that then to look at your own portfolios against those three different scenarios. They were due to produce some more work on this. That's been postponed as quite a few uh, pieces of work have been postponed because of the COVID-19 crisis. But we do expect that to come through. We do have some information, um, those scenarios for the insurance sector. Uh, and the banking ones, I think, will come through in due course, but they are currently on hold uh, that, that piece of work. But um, hopefully that's some resources and say we provide some links to that link to this that uh, people will find of use. Um, thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Rachel. So um, firstly, I too would recommend the PRI's work on the inevitable policy response. Um, even if you as an individual happen to think that that climate change wasn't happening, um, that you didn't need to, to mitigate it or even to adapt to it, you really need to believe that policymakers believe that it's happening and that regulation and sectoral regulation, sector specific regulation really, is changing accordingly. We saw some stuff even in the last um, budget around um, plastic tax and, and uh, taxation to try to move the UK towards greater decarbonisation. So I agree that is a really important piece of work that everyone should have a look at. The other thing that I should probably highlight, the PLSA has a whole host of um, different bits and pieces of resources which are, are free to all our members and other people who are interested. It's all in our Stewardship Central resource online. But our PLSA um, Stewardship and Voting Guidelines, which you mentioned at the beginning, Rachel, and if you think about responsible investment, we would say that being a good steward of your assets, which at its simplest is really just about looking after the assets which have been entrusted to your care by beneficiaries but that good stewardship and good engagement and using your vote effectively is how you put responsible investment into practice um, and this is something that again the mood music on stewardship and engagement and an asset stewardship is really changing and growing and reaching a sort of crescendo very very quickly it's doing that both for the private sector 
um, but it's also influencing the public sector as well. And of course, the stewardship code has now got a new refresh, a new update, and it's setting much more stringent standards for all different kinds of asset owners and asset managers. So the idea of this guidance is really just for those asset owners, private sector, public sector, who would like a very accessible, practical, step-by-step -step guide to how you might consider producing a stewardship policy, how you might consider producing a good engagement policy or a voting policy, how to hold your asset managers to account, because of course we recognize that many people will be outsourcing their engagement and stewardship work. It really aims at that. We also have at the back um, very granular, more granular voting guidelines, which are split on an issue by issue basis. And this year we're particularly proud because we uh, beefed up our climate change section. Um, you will read about a lot of the really interesting climate change shareholder resolutions that are currently being placed. Um, you know, Barclays had a uh, fossil fuel funding one recently that I believe, yes, there you go, Brunel, Brunel was um, involved in and many others as well. Um, we've seen other shareholder resolutions placed or possibly withdrawn, but this provides a practical guide for how you might consider doing your due diligence on which resolution to support, how you might consider uh, sort of some, some of the issues that you need to think about when you're thinking about the most effective way to wield your ownership influence on climate change. So I would encourage everyone to check that out. Right. Fantastic. And Rachel, um, just, I'm just going to realise that just um, a, a very obvious point probably is um, uh, Brunel um, has a website and um, we've actually published quite a few materials on there ourselves. So in, in addition, our stewardship policy and that has a, a bit like the PSA and that shows it, uh, what we've chosen uh, to, to talk about is this, that our stewardship policy is about 35 pages long and we're just about to issue uh, an update on that one so you can see where we're positioning ourselves. But actually for our climate change, we've actually uh, created like a bit of a resource centre ourselves and we've actually got uh, in addition to um, our own policies and statements we've actually got a document which is like a background briefing recognizing a, a little bit as our, our poll identified that not everybody knows what all of this acronyms are or some of this terminology and actually that document is designed um, to help uh, not only my own clients, but the clients um, with, with beneficiaries and then communication on that, where it kind of talks about what some of these initiatives and some of this language that um, if you're a bit like me and I live and breathe this every day, I get a bit familiar with it and I forget that perhaps not everybody uh, lives in that little bubble. Um, so we, we wrote this document. So again, by, I mean, I know that's all freely available on the Brunel website and I'd be absolutely delighted if it was of use to, to, to other funds out there. Right, fantastic. So you mentioned accountability, um, and we have a really good question from the audience here about that. So um, how important, just how important are industry standards on things like measuring ESG carbon footprint, and how close are we to seeing these standards emerge? Well, I'll kick off on that one a little bit, because um, I see the, the question uh, come in from, from Bob there. So. Um, we have uh, the greenhouse gas protocol, which does at least uh, sort of consistently define uh, what we mean by sort of when we talk about things like, again, more jargon, but apologies, by kind of scope one, scope two, and scope three um, carbon emissions, for example. But I have long been a supporter uh, and advocate for the fact that we need to have some stronger sort of quality guidelines around this so that the, the quality of ESG data sets is better. It's definitely one of the barriers out there. We have lots of, inf uh, lots of data points, but uh, quite how robust they all are is, is is still questionable so I absolutely support the uh, the premise of the question is we do have some and some data sets are stronger than others but I still think there's a little bit way to go and I would definitely welcome for example a British standard on carbon footprinting so when you read look at carbon footprinting and you bought it from different suppliers you knew that there was um, you know is this such and such compliant would that I think would be hugely beneficial and um, it's something we've called for for quite some time we will continue to call for it but unfortunately there isn't but I I would say that the, the quality of um, the providers out there is, is generally quite high, but I still think that there is some merit in having that robustness that comes from having something like a British or an ISO standard behind it. I'd agree with that. I mean, I think it's a, it's a fundamental position of the PLSA that greater consistency and comparability of information being provided all the way up through the investment chain is really important. It's just as important on carbon emissions as it is on any other topic. And if there was some kind of standard as Faith was talking about for certain bits of information reporting it wouldn't just make it easier for the investors it would make it easier for the companies themselves so when we have done collaborative engagements with companies recently on workforce issues and, and we had some LGPS funds involved with that one of the things that came out of each and every company meeting and I'm sure that Faith hears the same thing is from the companies saying we're being asked for a million and one slightly different data requests 
we have teams who are looking at this, but the burden of information that we're being asked for is just a bit too much. It would, it would help if there was some, some greater consistency in terms of the responses that we would ask. I think, I mean, this, aside from the actual metrics point, I think there is also something to be said for the number of um, attempts that there are to try to define what we mean by responsible investments. So Faith and Rachel and I have been discussing this previously, responsible investment, sustainable investment, ESG, SRI, um, even, even impact and ethical, um, even though you know, we might think that those are relatively well defined in certain bits of the industry. Um, and I think the British Standards Institute has been doing some really, really interesting work in terms of responsible investment, sustainable investment, and I look forward to seeing what they come out with there. But we fed into that and I think one of the things we'd be keen to see on any of the different attempts to try to create some consistency in definitions and language is some kind of um, third party assurance framework as well so that these initiatives don't just get used as another opportunity for greenwashing there you go another bit of of jargon that seems to be floating around increasingly in the industry at the moment right so um so just so personally if somebody has a question here um do you consider the present range of environmental measurements such as carbon footprint to accurately reflect the impact of various investments being pushed as environmentally damaging how do you understand responsible investing as opposed to ethical investing? Just quickly for the two of you. <laughs> so um, there's quite an, I'll unpack that question if I may, Jim, because uh, you've asked quite a few different things, in, in, wrapped, wrapped a few things in there. So first of all, carbon footprinting, um, I've been a big fan, I've used it for, um, for oh gosh, uh, about 15 years now. It is useful. It is not by any means the only thing you should use um, because it just tells you one side of the story and it, and, and the, and it has, there are, peculiarities in the data it can be distorted by currency impacts it can and different and different product providers and, and there are different denominators if you like in calculations so there's different ways to do a carbon footprint um, out there one of the ways that we we primarily use the one recommended by the task force for climate related disclosures which is to do with weighted average carbon intensity uh, because that allows you sort of quite clear comparability but carbon footprinting i think is is useful um, to just see kind of where you should prioritize. So we've done that across our portfolios and we identified in terms of like kind of relative to their benchmark, which uh, portfolios perhaps were more carbon intense and therefore where to put our energies. And then you can look at that at a more granular level in individual companies, particularly if they're operating in sectors which are reasonably homogeneous, is there an outlier? Is a company particularly, you know, um, stand out either because it's particularly inefficient or efficient? Uh, and then what, what's the story behind that? So I find carbon putting useful to, um, to stimulate questions rather than saying it gives you the answer i've often said that it's, you know, it's not the it doesn't it's not giving you answers it's just giving you some questions to to interrogate with the managers as to kind of why things are, are, are there and i think that is for me the essence between responsible investment and ethical investment responsible investment is do i understand the risks and um, all the risks that might be presented in terms of the investment case that i'm taking it does not mean that i take a kind of a values or a an emotional response to whether that's good, bad or indifferent. I just want to know, am I, have I priced in, have I brought that issue into my investment hypothesis on this particular um, product? Um, and that's the difference. It's one that's about the awareness of risk, the management of risk and, 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 be, and, and managing it, as opposed to eliminating that risk because you've taken a value judgment that's just something you don't want to be exposed to. Now, both are perfectly valid, but they are mm -hmm. quite distinct. Uh, and I think that idea of, uh, say responsible investment I always feel is, is more about questions than it is about answers sometimes to people's disappointment <laughs> so I would I would agree with everything that you just said and I think just in terms of the responsible investment and the ethical investment that yes it's sort of about you know thinking about risks and and for us it would really be about financially material factors and then non-financial factors and of course when you take it back to what the the law commission was looking at and what the private sector regs say about it's absolutely within private sector schemes fiduciary duty to consider financially material ESG risks. When it comes to thinking about non-financial factors, that is where the two-stage law commission test comes in. So does it, does it cause significant financial, would it cause significant financial detriment? And do you have reason to believe that your members would, would support you in doing this? And there's still a little bit of, in fact, quite a bit of gray around how exactly you ascertain sort of most of your members or just your members have a particular view, but you can take that from surveys, you can take that from um, UK 
public opinion polls you can take it from sort of other policy standards as well but but for us that's where the difference comes in so is it financial or is it non-financial and i think um, if i could just come jump back in again on um linking a few of the question themes um around we've talked about like materiality about kind of what are the most important environmental social and governance issues uh, that might have a financial detriment that's obviously the the uh, task force talks about the materiality of those so that that theme um resonates quite strongly and then we've also asked this question about standards uh, one and I, I will um sort of uh, just in case people feel i'm conflicted i'll be very honest we have uh, signed up and we are members of the sustainable accounting standards board um, alliance i sit on their um, investment advisory group and that's because we see the sasb standard that was developed which um, identifies and they again another tool that's out there is their materiality matrix now we would argue from a it's, it has come from the us and has a us focus and some of the work that i'm doing with sasb uh, in fact, tomorrow, uh, of doing some progressing some of that work is about perhaps looking at from a European and UK lens on kind of what might constitute materiality. But they have um, a materiality matrix which looks at all the different sectors and all the different issues. And then you can see kind of um, perhaps if I'm talking to a particular manager with exposures in that area, what uh, Salisbury have said essentially are the, the baseline. What are the minimum things that you should be uh, disclosing as a company if in this area and therefore what are the minimum or the most important things for that sector? Now that's not going to say that there aren't company specific ESG risks on top of that. Mm. But as a sector, if you want to know where to start, um, that is a really good matrix to identify what ESG risks matter most in individual sectors. So those that can, can lead you then to particularly pertinent questions with your asset managers. It isn't, and I, I'd be very keen, keen to acknowledge this, this isn't, it doesn't answer everything, but it's a, a good baseline. Right, thank you for that. So really interesting. Um, you talked a lot about investment risk and, and things for investors to consider, but um, can we also talk a little bit about um, stewardship and voting? Because I know that that's another, another big piece of being a responsible investor. And maybe Caroline, as the author of the PLSA's updated voting and stewardship guidelines, you might like to talk about a bit about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, yes, that's sort of this crescendo of mood music happening on stewardship at the moment. And I think one of the most important recent developments has been this expansion of stewardship in, in understanding and also in terms of the regulatory framework beyond just voting your equity holdings. So the new stewardship code has been very clear. I'm so, excuse me, Rachel, there's an extremely loud banging at the door. If I may now hand over to Faith, the problem of the problem with webinars whilst I go and sort that out. Apologies. Absolutely fine. <laughs> I shall pick up the mantle from, from Caroline there. Um, yeah, so we have the stewardship code which kind of sets out, um, and I think it, it is a lot more demanding, um, the stewardship code 2020. It sets out kind of what the expectations of, of good stewardship looks like, and it's, and it's far more broad than perhaps engagement and voting as we might have traditionally used the word stewardship. So it talks now about capital allocation, it's talking about governance and oversight. So it's far more extensive and um, I'm actually doing some bit of work with the FRC, with the cross pool group to actually look at kind of developing some tools to support the LGPS funds more, more broadly because the LGPS funds specifically have the Secretary of State's guidance, encouraging them to sign up to the code. But obviously that's, that guidance was written in the old code, not the new one. So we're very keen to kind of provide some support support um, you know as a community uh, to the funds so those who want to take that step and become um, fully fledged signatories um, to buy some, some tools to do that because it, it is no, no two ways about it it's, it's considerably more demanding and, and deliberately so um, and, and I think there is um, yeah it's, it, it's quite challenging we've um, we're going to be publishing in a few weeks time uh, Brunel's first responsible investment and stewardship outcomes report it's our first sort of if you like a bit of a dry run at uh, how, how close we get to kind of fulfilling what the FCA uh, was seeking, but most particularly what our beneficiaries are seeking. Because at the end of the day, this is what it's all got to be about. Do your beneficiaries understand what you're doing with their money and, and, uh, and help? They, they are ultimately who I think we're being held to account by. And, and that's what this, our report. So trying to blend a little bit um, what the FRC want, what the FCA want through the shareholder rights directive, 
what um, our beneficiary wants and trying to blend that all into one report it was no easy feat uh, this is our first go and I'm sure we'll have a lot of lessons learned how we need to build that one for, for the deadline next year so for those less familiar the deadline for the FRC is the 31st of March um, next year is for those who want to be in the first phase of being signatories to, to the new code but don't panic you don't actually have to hit that deadline they'll be doing so they'll be staged kind of you can come on board any at any point from there so uh, because I think otherwise I think the FRC will be a little bit overwhelmed if you're all, all, all of us all piled in with our reports uh, they'd, they'd have a quite a job of work on there but um, yes there's quite a lot I think in that that will guide you and I think there's quite a lot within the PLSA's work that can guide you to kind of what good stewardship looks like so perhaps if I can have them hand the mental back to Caroline to finish what she was saying about the work that they've been doing at the PLSA. Yes thank you very much for that faith apologies for that very important Amazon delivery apparently that had to be delivered right now um, so yes um, stewardship code I think faith is right to talk about the resource requirements um, that are involved in being a signatory to the stewardship code. Um, we absolutely support the direction which it's gone. We agree that now is the right time with the SRD2 requirements coming in for the stewardship code to be ratcheted up an extra level. We think it's a really helpful tool. Um, we know that there are asset owners out there who feel like reporting against it might be a little bit too resource intensive. We would still encourage you to look at it. The FRC has said, as, as Faith has said, that they are willing to take a sort of more relaxed approach to people taking the time to really get it right. Um, but the kind of outcomes based reporting is really important for letting your beneficiaries know exactly what it is that you're up to. And, and maybe just sort of finishing the point that I'd started making before my delivery arrived was thinking about moving beyond voting of your equity shareholdings, which still seems very much to be the misperception amongst the asset owners and even some of the asset managers when you talk about stewardship that's just about exercising your voting rights effectively. That is a key part of it, but there is absolutely no barrier to you thinking about how you're a good steward of your fixed income holdings. It's even perfectly possible to engage on, on some of the sovereign debt that you hold as well. There are some resources on the PLSA website. The PRI also has some excellent guides to active ownership across the different asset classes. So when your asset manager comes to you and talks about their engagement with stewardship, um, you should be asking not just the equity managers, but you should be asking your fixed income managers as well exactly what they're doing on, on your behalf um, to be good stewards of the assets, um, how they are complying with the stewardship code. If they are not signatories to the stewardship code, so please kindly explain why not. We know that many of our asset owner members actually have a fundamental baseline, the fact that they require all their asset managers to sign up to the stewardship code. And honestly, the, the coverage is so great that from our perspective, we see very little reasons to why asset managers shouldn't be signing up to it to begin with. But um, that was the point that I was going to make. Right, well, excellent. We have time for one more question. And as you were talking about you know, taking on board members' views, and stewardship. We have a question here about um, from Bob Holloway, actually, of the Scheme Advisory Board. Given the recommendations made by the Law Commission, Scheme members' views, how the government took those forward for the private sector, and what the Supreme Court judgment said about who owns the LGPS funds, where does this leave LGPS fund authorities on the extent to which they should take on board their Scheme members' views on investments? Just to caution you, you probably need to answer this in about one minute each. <laughs> okay, I'll be super, super fast, and you will go first, Caroline. Uh, uh, yes, okay, all right, I can, I, I'll try to be quick as well. So um, we, you know, when, when it comes to ethical investment in the recent Supreme Court decision, we, um, we would always say that LGPS funds and, and pools should be thinking with investing with an eye to members' views, not just their risk profile, attitude to risk or their demographics, but also what they think about certain issues on ESG. However, scheme investment decision makers, it must be clear that they retain that responsibility for the investment decisions that they make. Engage with your members, have that two-way communication with them. I think the thing that you're referring to, Bob, is, is one of the sort of almost side comments that happened between the two judges about whether it was it, it's members' money, it's not, it's not public money. Um, I know that there's been some conversation about that in the industry, but my feeling was that sort of they haven't really come to a judgment on that. That's kind of a, a side comment. That's, that's not necessarily under discussion. I know that MHCLG is continuing to examine this particular issue, so I don't think it's the last we've heard of it. No, indeed, and, and I'll, I'll sort of build out on that. Um, I think, um, 
you know, the, the LTPS, it is the, the money is um, managed by the administering authority to pay those pensions when they fall due. Um, so that is the kind of the, 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 the sort of the, the main focus there in terms of that. But um, I think responsible investment, uh, wherever you go, whatever jurisdiction you're under, um, certainly advocates the idea of having a really broad understanding of your stakeholder views, whether they be your taxpayers, whether they be your beneficiaries, whether they be your employers, that actually that's quite a healthy uh, way to actually work out where the ESG risks, where the investment risks are sit within your, it's, it's a really useful lens to bring to, that, bring, bring to that committee. So I think it's quite healthy. And I said, I don't think that's particularly driven by any particular jurisdiction. That's just good, responsible investment. And um, the LGPS is different. Um, and, and I think we do need to recognize that. And I believe that MHCRG are gonna do some work to kind of clarify things in, in, in the coming months. Right. Yeah, and, and just to finish off because it was Bob who asked the question. I I know that the Scheme Advisory Board had obviously done this this interesting piece of work trying to clarify where all the different duties lie for LGPS funds, and it's one of the questions that comes up most often at any of our conferences on this subject. And you know, I know more clarity would be great. I know it's really complicated for the funds as well. It's not quite as clear cut ish as it is for the private sector schemes. Um. I'd like to thank Faith and Caroline for joining us today and thank all of you for watching. And we really hope to see you in person before too long. Thanks so much.